Prince Edward Island is actually considered the first place anywhere in Canada to ever have an automobile. And then it completely banned cars. And then it partly unbanned them, but only on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. But then people got so mad that they had a whole referendum on it and they banned cars again. And then later, when the government tried to legalize cars, the vote ended in a tie. You're listening to Backyard History, the hidden stories that happened in your own backyard. The podcast version of the weekly history column running in newspapers across the Maritimes. With your host and author, Andrew McLean. Prince Edward Island, despite being Canada's smallest province, actually has the longest history with the automobile. It is considered to be the first place in all of Canada to ever get one. That particular distinction comes with a few notable caveats, though. First, it wasn't actually Canada, and secondly, it wasn't actually a car. Canada's first car arrived in PEI in 1866. But that was before there actually was a Canada. When Canada formed the following year, PEI didn't join. So there's that. And it wasn't a car as we'd understand it. It was a horseless carriage. It looked like a carriage, the very old fashioned kind with an enclosed inside. You know, like the type that Cinderella took to a ball. With the driver holding reins on a bench outside, sitting up front with a team of horses. Except on this one, there were no horses. Instead, there was a full steam-powered engine. The whole thing was wildly impractical. The engine took a lot of time to warm up, the vehicle couldn't go very fast, and there was always a risk that it might blow up. It was imported to PEI in December of 1866 by Georges Antion Belcourt, the parish priest of Rustico. He bought it in Philadelphia, and he drove it in Rustico Saint Jean Baptiste Day parade and picnic. By all accounts, his parishioners were shocked. It didn't exactly take off, though. We have to skip ahead another 39 years before we find the second car in PEI. This one was also steam powered. It was bought up by a group of Charlottetown businessmen as a business investment and it took people on tours around Charlottetown. Fares for a ride on it cost 10 cents. 1902 seems to be the appearance of the first actual car, in a sense that a car that we would actually recognize. Jesse A. Wright of Bedeck noted in his diary on September 12th, 1902. Walter Duell brought an automobile here this afternoon. I had a ride in it. By 1908, there were seven actual cars, as we would recognize them, prowling around the island, all powered by gasoline and everything. By then, the newfangled invention of the automobile was being enthusiastically embraced all over the whole continent. In 1908, Ontario was opening its first production line for building a new Canadian car called the Russell McLaughlin. McLaughlin Automobiles would be one of the many homegrown Canadian car manufacturers that would dominate the North American market for the first half of the 20th century. At the opening of the factory, Ontario's Premier Whitney declared, These vehicles are here to stay. Only a matter of days later though, PEI banned cars completely. The vote in PEI's legislature to ban cars was not even close. Actually, it was the opposite of close. They had voted to ban cars by a margin of 28 to 0. PEI became the only place in all of North America to ban the car completely. Okay, so why did they ban the car? I mean, after all, there were only seven cars on the entire island at the time. Well. One reason seemed to be that they frightened horses. Robert Jenkins of Mount Albion, for example, wrote to the Guardian newspaper on March 6th, 1908. When driving through Bunbury, as soon as my horse saw the automobile, he wheeled in his tracks and began kicking in the wagon. 
Those in charge of the automobile brought the machine to a halt, and it was only after I backed the horse past it that I felt safe to get into the carriage again. Many farmers refuse to let their wives and daughters drive on the roads unless accompanied, and the pleasure of a quiet ride on our country roads will be rare if those vehicles are allowed to travel as they are now. Cars were quite different back then than from today. They were very loud, and they were very smelly. It was often said that the frightened horses could smell them coming before they actually saw them. Horses were frightened and would try and get away from them, trying to pull off to the sides of the roads. And PEI didn't have very good roads. Newspaper reports from Quebec and Ontario from the time tell stories of cars driving on the roads in all sorts of weather, and even in winter. This was definitely not the case in PEI. Roads back then were often just one lane, they didn't have ditches on either side, and they didn't even have the branches on the trees overhanging them trimmed. Meaning that when a car came zipping along, there was nowhere for the horses to pull off to. I myself actually managed to get my own car stuck on a rural PEI road a couple years ago. Google Maps had taken me down a road that it claimed was a shortcut. It was, in fact, not a shortcut, and it wasn't even much of a road. It was more of a muddy dirt path that vaguely resembled a First World War trench with all the spring rains. And there I was, driving my decade-old Honda Civic, which, of course, isn't exactly an all-terrain vehicle. The car got completely stuck in that famous PEI red mud, and I do mean stuck. The wheels were sitting in a pool of water, the engine up on a pile of mud, and the car was just absolutely covered in mud. So here I am, covered in mud, stuck in the middle of nowhere, late spring, getting dark, getting cold. Great. Now what? I walked down the road a few miles as darkness fell, and I approached a farm to ask for help. As I was walking up to the house, I spotted a farmer going into his barn. I, looking like the abominable mud monster, followed him into his barn. It was filled with cows, and the farmer was wearing blue coveralls. The farmer didn't even seem surprised to see me. I asked him for help pulling my car out of the mud. He looked me up and down, all covered in mud, and he shook his head, and he sighed. Turned out that this kind of thing happened fairly often. The farmer told me that he'd get his tractor and chains and tow me out as soon as he milked the cows. So I just waited around the barn while he milked the cows. He wasn't really a chatty fellow, so I just kind of awkwardly stood there in silence. Once that was done, he got his tractor, which is a loud old blue machine, and I hopped on the guardrail and grabbed something to hold onto, and we rumbled off down the muddy road towards my car. The silent farmer attached some heavy chains, got the car dragged out. It was quite an ordeal, actually. I was definitely really stuck. I was actually rather surprised when he didn't stop once the car was free, though with his baby blue tractor dragging the poor old thing all the way back to his farm as I trotted along behind down that muddy dirt road. Once back at the farm, he got a pressure washer and he hosed off all that red mud from my car. He even hosed off my boots as I wore them. He refused my offer to pay him for his help. He said in a gruff voice, It is a nice day, let's keep it that way. It wasn't actually a nice day at all, but I did appreciate the sentiment. Anyways, all of that happened in 2019. So, if that was the state of the roads then, imagine driving on them 110 years earlier. PEI back in the early 1900s was a very rural place, and I do mean very rural. The island didn't even have a city. The capital of Charlottetown back then was home to just under 10,000 people. The whole island's population was slightly under 100,000 people. Because PEI had no cities or large urban centers, it didn't ever encounter the problems that came with horses in the cities. We kind of laugh now at the idea that people cheered the coming of the car as a solution to the pollution of horse manure. Obviously, cars create a little bit of pollution themselves. However, all the horse manure back then actually did have some pretty serious side effects, notably in terms of sanitation and disease. 
one single urban workhorse could dump between 20 and 50 pounds of manure a day on the street, along with a gallon of piss. If you multiply that by, let's say, the estimated 500 horses per square mile that were working in downtown Montreal back then, well, you've got a pretty serious problem. All of this manure was left in the dusty unpaved streets, and then it was stomped down into the road by other passing horses. Now, just imagine all the flies, and all the rodents, all the mice, and the smell. And then, there's the drivers. You know how Montrealers drive today. So now just imagine them driving 2,000 pound living animals around, and think of that downtown that I mentioned earlier, and think of how there were so many large cities like this across the whole continent, and then you can see why people were so eager to embrace the horseless carriage in urban centers. But of course, PEI had no urban centers, so none of that was an issue. While it would make sense that horses were scared of cars, Rudy Cronkin makes the argument in his book called Ban the Automobile Instrument of Death that it wasn't the horses that were scared at all, it was the people. For example, Charlottetown's Reverend Fullerton complaining to the newspapers that people were staying away from the church out of fear of encountering vehicles. More than that though, we get a pretty explicit hint that PEI's ban on cars is about more than horses from D.P. Irving. He was the member of the legislature who seconded the resolution to ban automobiles. In his speech, urging legislators to ban cars in PEI, he declared, there will be no hardship inflicted by suppressing them. They are owned by men of wealth and leisure who force the public off the road. In all likelihood, banning cars in PEI was probably in large part a populist swipe against the rich. Since there weren't necessarily that many rich on PEI itself, it was probably more of a vain lashing out towards a wider group of rich people who had inflicted pain on them. In 1908, the GDP in Canada contracted a crushing 7.8%. The country was in a brutal recession, possibly the worst one in its history, until the Great Depression. Despite Canadians suffering in it, the whole thing actually had nothing at all to do with Canada in the slightest. So there was an angry mood nationally that it was unfair that the economy was in the state. The short version of what happened was that some American bankers tried to make a risky gamble in the stock market. They were trying to buy up all the copper companies at once to create a monopoly to jack up prices. It would have made them a lot of money if they pulled it off. But they failed at whatever it was they were trying to achieve, and the boldness of their plan and its consequences spooked Wall Street, and virtually overnight, the stock market dropped by 40%. As 1907 events were called the Banker's Crisis at the time in Canada, as ordinary working people were suffering because of some weird thing that nobody understood in a different country, headlines in Canada were reporting on a slew of federal investigations finding widespread corruption in Canada's own insurance and banking sectors. Basically, the short of it is that the public mood was rather angry at the time at the wealthy in general. They often seem as self-absorbed and uncaring about the pain they inflicted on normal people as they went around doing whatever it was that rich people do. The automobile being loud, smelly, dangerous, impractical, and most importantly, inconveniencing all the normal everyday hardworking people. Cars were therefore the perfect metaphor for the catastrophic state of the economy at the time. PEI's politicians were headed into an election which kicked off only a month after the vote to ban cars. The public was angry at the bankers who crashed the economy in the name of greed. While there was nothing PEI's politicians could do about Wall Street, banning cars was an easy, consequence-free, and universally popular move to appease angry voters before they hit the polls. This complete and total ban on cars and PEI would last five years, until 1913. In those five years, cars had changed an awful lot. Now, cars were vastly more popular. 
common and affordable on the mainland. There, they were being used for motoring around, as it was called, which was leading to much more tourism, which of course boosted local economies. Islanders were watching the world change right next to them, right across the Northumberland Strait in New Brunswick. There, the main railway company, Intercontinental Railways, had announced it would transport cars around to make travel and tourism much easier in a time when there was still relatively few roads between cities. And in that province's largest city of St. John, Ford had just opened a big automobile manufacturing plant featuring its new innovation of the assembly line. Ford's famous assembly line had actually debuted within weeks of PEI banning the car. And its new mass production techniques made cars cheaper and more plentiful than ever before. Back when PEI had banned the car in 1908, a Model T Ford, which was definitely by far the cheapest kind of car out there, cost $850. However, in 1913, the price of a brand new Model T Ford had dropped by nearly half to only $490, which would be worth, in today's money, about $13,000 for a new car. Seeing the boost of tourism dollars across the strait, business people in Charlottetown complained that the ban on automobiles was costing them $90,000 a year in lost money from tourists avoiding PEI because of the ban on cars. I have no idea where they got that suspiciously precise number from, but it's something like two and a half million dollars in today's money, so it's not exactly insignificant. Under pressure from Charlottetown's business community, the elected officials at Province House, which is what PEI's legislature is called, narrowly voted to change the law to allow motoring on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Cars were still banned, though, on Tuesdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. If that seems complicated, just wait. It's gonna get worse. These changes were passed in April of 1913. There was an immediate and heavy backlash, including farmers blockading roads in protest. Other forms of protest included farmers refusing to take their food to the market, which was leading to the potential for food shortages. Horace Wright of Bedeck pretty well summed up the mood at one anti-automobile meeting in 1913 when he said, We're going to keep them cars out if we have to take a pitchfork and drive it through them. This three days a week of car driving compromise didn't exactly work for drivers either. Cars back then were notoriously problem plagued and particularly prone to breaking down or getting flat tires. Drivers who got stranded somewhere, like, let's say, for example, I don't know, stuck in the mud, found that they would have to wait a whole extra days to go back home because of the driving ban. Only three months later, that very June, an island-wide referendum was held where people would vote on whether or not to ban the car. According to Edward MacDonald, in his book called if you're strong-hearted, Prince Edward Island in the 20th century, the government suppressed the results of the referendum. Basically, the results were too embarrassing for the government, so they chose to just not release them. He estimated that the results showed that 90% of islanders had voted to ban the automobile. So the government came up with another compromise of sorts, in which some parts of the island would ban cars, and other parts of the island would allow them, despite the will of the majority in the referendum clearly rejecting cars. The specific mechanism to get around the referendum results was actually really complicated. The local area would specifically need to have another referendum, on voting whether or not it would allow that earlier law, which was called the Automobile Act, to come into force. So this meant that even then, 
drivers would still only be allowed to drive on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And not only that, there was a remarkably high threshold to 75% of the voters in the referendum needed to support it for anyone to be allowed to drive cars. This led to some strange scenes, like when wealthy fox fur seller Frank Tuplin, who lived in Summerside, which had banned the car, would load his car onto a train and he would take it to Charlottetown to drive it because Charlottetown had not banned the automobile. This bizarre hybrid ban on cars would not last long though. The entire world would soon change dramatically during the First World War in every conceivable way. If someone fell into a coma in the summer of 1914 and woke up in the winter of 1918, they would have found that virtually everything they knew had changed in only four years. Islanders' opinions on the automobile shifted quite quickly during the war, with so many of their strong, healthy, young men gone off fighting in some strange, faraway land. They needed help with farming. Even if farmers were exempted from going to war, there was suddenly a massive new demand for food from all over the world, from Australia to Britain. And not only that, but the amounts these foreign lands would pay for whatever food they produced skyrocketed, offering PEI's farmers a rare opportunity to make some really good money, if only they could keep up with the demand. It turned out for the farmers that automobiles, and more specifically, trucks and tractors, were a pretty big help around the farm. For example, tractors that could pull cars out of the mud. By 1916, two years into the war, much more of the island had voted in these local referendums to open themselves up to cars. Finally, in 1918, the government voted to completely lift the automobile ban. But wait, it wasn't uncontroversial though. There was still a great deal of opposition and drama around the legislators voting to unban the car and many elected officials with the governing conservatives actually crossed the floor to join the liberals in an effort to defeat it and keep cars banned in PEI. In the end, the vote was a tie, with 14 MLAs supporting the car and 14 opposing. The Speaker of the House broke the tie by voting for automobiles and cars have been driving around in PEI ever since. It was only then that many rural islanders actually saw a car for the very first time in their lives. Decades later, 86-year-old Cyril McFarland reminisced about seeing a car for the first time back in 1918 to historian Deborah Stewart. I remember when I saw my first car. It came down this road and I was working in the field at the time. I stopped everything and saw the car go by. It was a man from Freetown. It was in the spring of the year, and he was going down to a neighbor's to get some grain. I can remember the day just as if it were yesterday. I remember. Yes, it was quite a sight. I don't know why people were against the car. People are queer on this island. But I don't know if we're better off or worse for having it. It used to be that there was more neighborliness somehow. That was Backyard History with your host, Andrew McLean. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for another hidden story that happened in your own backyard. Cyril McFarlane, voiced by Kaylin Fraser. Produced by Jordan Lozier.